Hi, guys. Thanks for watching the podcast. My name is Jared Alderman. Today, we have Patrick Howard, the owner and founder of Mobius Poker, a high stakes training program. And he got his start in poker detox with his brother, Nick Howard. And today we get into the details of a mass data approach to gameplay, how that can be meshed with other types of theoretical approaches. We also get pretty deep into the conversation about what's been going on on Twitter lately in the poker space. So first half of this conversation is much more about poker strategy and Patrick's own personal journey. And then the second half, we talk about just how we would like to see the conversation on Twitter change and why that might not likely be the in the cards for us as the poker community. So enjoy. I hope you like it. I now bring you Patrick Howard. Uh, awesome. Uh, welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, you have a lot of interesting insights into a lot of the games that I've played. And um, somehow I, I didn't know who you were for far too long as a poker player. And then suddenly you were everywhere that I looked on Twitter. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yeah, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to just talk to you about is because I don't think I've ever heard it anywhere. It's just give me your, like, what's your background? How did you get started in poker? What's sort of like your poker journey been like? What brings you to today in as little as much detail as you want to go into? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it is, it's kind of a long story, so I won't go too deep into it, but yeah. I've been playing poker my whole life pretty much like okay. since I, before I can remember playing just with my grandfather, just for play money, he introduced me to poker and then Nick started playing online poker nick howard my older brother he's five years older than me okay he's also a poker coach for people who don't know he is the ceo of poker detox and uh he started playing online when he was like i think 17 on full tilt stars um which i assume is okay to talk about now <laughs> i guess like 15 years in the past but um uh, there's got to like, be a statute very, of limitations on that. Very slight. Yeah. Especially for full tilt, right? Yeah. Especially for full tilt. <laughs> he was like very slightly underaged and I was five years younger than him. And I was also obsessed with poker. We were both chess players mm. as kids and our dad would drive us around the country to chess tournaments. Nick was always much better at chess than me. I was not that great at chess, but I tagged along. And when he started playing online poker, I started watching him and playing for play money. And then uh, one day he let me finish a tournament that he had to, like he was just playing a $10 tournament. He had to leave. Mm. He let me finish it. And I just happened to final table it. Oh, nice. I, was, I think I was 12 or 13 at this point. Um, the hype. I can't imagine. It was, yeah, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> and I think cashed for around 1500 and he let me take half. Oh, nice. And then I had an online bankroll and I, I literally like played heavily from like low to mid stakes for two to three years after that. So I had like a lot of experience from a young age playing online poker. Mm. I was like a marginal winner. Um, Cause it was pretty easy to win yeah. back then. This was, I think 2004 ish. Okay. Like very early. Yep. And then I stopped playing poker shortly after it. I think Nick left home because he, he moved out around 20 or 21. Okay. And then I just kind of lost interest in poker for a while. Um, and then I like went to college. I got a degree in physics mm. and was going to do that. And Basically, once I got into graduate school, I realized it wasn't the right track for me. Mm. And I decided to quit that program. And then I visited Nick on one of his retreats for Poker Detox Coaching for Profits. He had just started this program and he had like a handful of students. And they had a, they were doing a retreat in Spain, in Barcelona, and I met them. And through that, I just kind of fell back into poker. Mm. And that was late 2017 so for like the last five years i've been full-time poker again and the first three years of that were working for my brother at poker detox okay 
and I eventually worked my way up to uh, really like creating pretty much all of the strategies that we used uh, starting 2018. And then 2019, I started to coach a lot more and do more research and kind of upgrade the strategies that we were all working with. Yeah. And then 2020 and 2021, it was like full time at Poker Detox. I was leading the strategy development there. And then 2022, I started my own high stakes coaching company, Mobius Poker. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So that's sort of like an overview of what I do. And I don't play that much anymore. I just mostly focus on research and creating new stuff for my students. That sounds like a good mix for you, given your your background, like just going the physics route. Now you get to like do research, but in like a poker domain, that sounds very, what, what was it about the PhD that you didn't like or let, was it something you didn't like or did you feel like you were missing something you really liked about poker or was it? I just, I don't really know if it was just the program that I was in. Like, I think possibly if I had just stayed in pure physics, I would have been more interested, but I went into biophysics, which is like medical wow. applications of physics research. And it just wasn't the right program for me. Mm. I wasn't really there for the right reasons. I was just sort of following a pretty standard track from college to graduate for school sure. and not thinking about it too much. And I just thought like, you know, this is a good profession. I get to help people and yeah, actually save lives and stuff. But unfortunately, I just wasn't that interested in it. And yeah. I just felt like no matter how like good of a profession it is, on paper, I'm not really going to make that much of an impact if I'm not truly engaged in this. So Definitely. I just decided to hit the eject button pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned your brother was the the better chess player. Who do you feel is the better poker player right now? <laughs> is that a loaded question? <laughs> I think so. I gave it to Nick that he's the better chess player by far. So I'm going to say I'm the better poker player. You're going to say you're the better poker player? Awesome. <laughs> but that's, that's not been tested. We've never played like, against each other. Um, yeah, that's always an interesting question because it's kind of hard to evaluate because it's like like six max or who would win heads up or like, you know what I mean? Like that's all a little different. I, I think it can be, but um, yeah, that's fun. That's that's the only video I'm going to like popularize from this. It's just that you're the, that you say you're the better <laughs> poker player. <laughs> um, do you, uh, Out of curiosity, do you think he would agree? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. Yeah. The thing is, Nick popularized, popularized um, a lot of the data science side of poker. Definitely. And he, he like started that idea. But I was a lot better equipped to really take that idea and run with it. I see. It's like he introduced me to that. He was doing that before I came back into poker. And he exposed me to like, oh, you can do this like population research. Yeah. And then I just took that and ran with it. And I figured out stuff that he wasn't. Yeah. He just wasn't able to figure out because I had this background in science and I was able to go a lot deeper with it. So that's why I, I feel like I'm I ended up being a stronger player just because I was able to use those tools better. How popular but, was yeah. that kind of approach? Sorry, you did I catch your offer. It's okay. I, I I was just going to I was going to throw him one more bone and just say, <laughs> if you took away that aspect, if you just like, if you just gave us both a new game to play, oh, okay, and it's a strategy game, I think Nick initially we'll is be <laughs> better than me at most just strategy games. But if you like give me something like that that I can actually study with, then I'll probably have an edge long term. This is a very scientific uh, hedging of bets around like what your claims are of. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, you're like, well, in this context, in this environment, in this way, well, yeah, strong claims. Yeah, strong claims. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I've actually had basically no contact with Nick, so I, I don't. I've never spoken with him or anything like that. But I, I maybe I'll have to get him on the podcast and ask him the same question. Um, yeah. Yeah, you said he, I'm curious because I wasn't familiar when how did was it Nick who started the sort of like MDA like approach like population tendencies like or was it kind of a thing and then he like really blew it up or like went somewhere you really unique with it and then um, it, it was definitely a thing. Yeah, like so I don't really know. I'm not a very good person to ask about this because yeah, 
I like I, I kind of live under a rock a little bit and, and I was totally out of poker for many years. So I didn't really know. But like when I came back in late 2017, uh Nick had like hired some people to do this type of work for yeah. him. And I think they were they were starting to do some research and hold a manager. But then Hantonote came out shortly after that. And Hantonote has this range research where you can take your pool yeah. and run really advanced statistics on it very quickly. Yeah. So for them to have developed that, I th I think that I don't know when they released it, maybe around 2017. So they people obviously were thinking about this if Hantonote developed this range research tool. Right. Obviously. Yeah. Um so when you are playing, like you actually, I know you say you don't play much, but I've recently, I, you've posted some play and explains lately. Mm -hmm. How are you like using this, this data you have, or like, you know, like you're familiar with combined with like the merging of what is theoretically correct combined with like the uniqueness of the particular situation you're in, like how is all of this like sort of melding together to make a decision in the moment um, for you? So it, it depends on the context and who I'm playing against. Right. But I have two different strategies depending on if I'm playing a regular or a recreational. Okay. And if I'm playing against a recreational, I'm much more just relying on my data and the exploits that I figured out against recreational players. Right. Because you can sort of go max exploit right. against recreationals because they're not paying attention to what you're doing. Right. But against everybody else, like against all the regulars, I'm not going max exploit at all. I was initially. So like the progression for me was learn mostly exploits and like just very basic theory. Like where can I see about my entire range? and like had just on the turn just playing like super simple strategies and i was able to get away with that because i started on bavada which is anonymous so yeah. like even if you're playing a pretty exploitable post-flop strategy nobody can really do anything because they don't know who you are right um so it was like i had a first regs i had a pretty simple strategy not max exploit but like just a very simple strategy to get myself to the river um and then just turning up the exploits more on the river yeah and so just like using my whatever in-game feel on the river to try to make the best decisions yeah but at a certain point once i was pretty satisfied with my exploits that's when i started to move on to more advanced theory and like for the last two years I've pretty much, I don't want to say only, but like 80 to 90% just been focused on theory. Interesting. And, and like learning how to play specifically up to the river in a very balanced way. Yeah. So now against regulars, like I would say I'm playing pseudo GTO up yeah. to the river. And then like sometimes I'll take exploits pre river, but, um, a lot of times the exploits get turned up more on the river based on like what I think my opponent's actually going to do. Yeah, that makes sense. This is this is funny to hear you say this, because when I work with students and even just my own personal approach almost mirrors this exactly, even though I have done very none of like the same data stuff as you. My explanations for this are always like it's hard to understand like how people's tendencies early streets trickle out into future streets and then also wherever people make messing up on early streets all compound on the river and so then you can make very usually very strong strategic adjustments and the rivers are the most rare so they're the hardest for people to kind of kind of catch on to mm -hmm. is there anything you would add to that picture of why you seem to approach it that way or no i think that's that's pretty much how i think about it yeah um, like you need to be able to play a solid flop and turn strategy if you're in known pools with decent yeah. regulars. Otherwise, you're going to, especially as you move up in stakes, you're going to run into people who actually are able to take EV away from you. Right. Um, Even in known pools, though, do you find that there are nodes that are just so poor, like 
even known pools and fairly competitive environments, do you find that there are nodes that are being responded to so poorly that you can take a pretty exploitative adjustment? And even when people try to adjust to your adjustment, they'll still be playing poorly. So like, it's yeah. just, it's like, it's worth it. Cause I've, I feel like I found that to be the case in some, some certain nodes. Yeah, definitely. But like poker obviously is a game of deception. Yeah. It's right. just more about like not bashing people over the head with whatever you're exploiting yeah. them with. Yeah. <laughs> and like, if you just try to like one layer of disguising whatever you're doing is usually enough because it's very hard. People are not usually paying that close attention. Right. To what you're doing. Yeah. I, I, this is a node that I talk about often. I've talked about it too much now because when I play on known sites, I've, I've noticed people are adjusting to me, but uh, it's the turn probe line where it's like one of the very commonly like overfolded lines. Yeah. And when I work with students a lot, it's like, you can get pretty reckless in this line. And I was like, just like, the, the, it's it's overfolded so much that's like the, the amount of times you're going to get the showdown are so rare and then when you see rare and then when they when the hand pops up people will just be like oh that's weird and they'll likely just move on they really won't think anything else about it mm -hmm. um when when you're working i was i'm curious on your background with detox and like do you find when you were working with people very much like oh let me, let me just ask this first before i presume something is detox very like like here's a handbook strategy just do this like just do this like very little critical thought and just like just copy these these this playbook go uh yes and no so there there is like a pretty cut and dry strategy mm -hmm. and it's been tested and proven to work and we often like at detox, we take people who are starting out at low stakes. It's usually, we don't usually get people who are winning a lot of money, like long-term playing online poker. It's usually people who have kind of struggled for yeah. a while. Right? So if I have a system that I know works, at least up to a certain point, yeah, and I can just give you this and say, follow this system and you'll right. win. And right. you've been playing online poker for five years and you haven't been able to win, then it's like well, you should probably follow that system and start winning first. And then we can talk about yes, yes, making, yes, yes. making whatever changes you want to make to it. Yeah. But I wouldn't say, I mean, I've been not coaching there for over a year. So yeah. So I, I can't say like what it is like right now, but I doubt that it's like this even now. But when I was coaching, I definitely didn't like shoot down critical thinking or people. I really invited people questioning yeah. everything. And I, I think one of the things that made my work for detox really special was a lot of it was strategies built on data, but I actually gave everyone the data. So mm -hmm. like if I, instructed people to let's just say because you just brought up this example people overfold to turn probes a lot yeah so if i'm instructing people to overbluff the turn probe i'm not just saying overbluff the turn probe i'm saying you know you should do this and here's why and actually yeah. like showing them the research that i did literally in enough detail that they could go recreate that research they wanted to right right and i find that showing people the data behind the strategies that you're developing really helps a lot for getting people on board with the strategies because yeah. the strategies end up when you're working with data they end up being very counterintuitive like often very aggressive yeah. at times and then other times you can go the other way and be super passive and, and people are unsure about whether or not they actually should be playing like this and the more yeah. evidence you can provide the better so um yeah it is it's like it is kind of a handbook um but people also see why they're doing what they're doing yeah do you find it to be like do you find a lot of the spots um i've noticed you comment on like some of phil galfon's uh like like advice for bluffing etc and like advice for and i've had similar thoughts i've commented on one of his as well where he was he was mentioning like basically bluff regs like this bluff fish like this and a description that 
in my experience, I don't have as I, I'm not privy to I've done very limited mass data analysis. I've definitely done some. Um, it was the op kind of the opposite where it was like, I think well, I don't want to I'll say what I think. I think regs my my general observation has been that regs overfold in spots where they just have generally weak holdings and fish overfold in spots where they pursue you to have strong holdings. Like they'll bloat the amount of strong holdings you have. And, but they're very willing to call you down if it's a spot that doesn't make sense for them for, for you to have a strong hand fish. And that's tons of caveats on what makes sense to fish. Um, but then my view of it is that regs will, if just you just find a spot where they're more capped than they should be, they'll just fold more than they should. Um, because I think there's a whole generation of regs who learned how to, the way you make money in poker is when you don't know you fall. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, that's, that's my perception of it. Do you, I'm, I'm asking this cause I'm wondering, are all the spots as counter, like, are they, all they, uh, is it very counterintuitive you think what the data shows, or is it just like counterintuitive to a point? And then there's like, there's some like threads you can kind of connect to all these points or do you view literally view it as like random which spots are overfolded what spots are overcalled like that's a big question but yeah. no i get it um there's definitely a lot of randomness mm. it's it, there is that but also there's patterns too um the phil galfon stuff i interact with him a lot because I like his stuff and I also just want the engagement. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So obviously. <laughs> it's, it's like pretty it's like pretty easy. I just comment. Uh, yeah. You know? And I, I always try to like be positive on Twitter. So you yeah. know, I'll like and retweet his stuff and then comment on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a little bit quid pro quo. Sure. <laughs> um, but some of the stuff that he has said about people's bluffing tendencies while I would say that almost everything that he says is great. The stuff that he said about people's bluffing tendencies ha has been off base at times. And it just doesn't, it doesn't um, like flesh out with the data comport with my research. Yeah. Um, and another thing I would say is that he plays a lot of PLO and I've never done any PLO type mm -hmm. of research. So maybe I'm, I'm I'm interested to do that at some point, like just see how people bluff in PLO and if it's like the same mm. or how people defend in PLO and if it's the same and hold them. Um, I guess I'll just say this. If you see anybody saying that an entire class of player defends too much on the river, you should be skeptical mm. because it's extremely hard to over defend on the river, like extremely yeah. hard, just mathematically, because you I, have to. I've had my moments. <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely some people, some players, who <laughs> even like, so if you're like playing like a solver, your river fold to bet is going to be in the mid 40s. Mm. So like on average, when you're facing a bet, you probably fold like 45% of the time. time. Okay. Yeah. Maybe 50. I don't know, because there's no, you, you can't have like you can't run that stat in pio like put it in a real game and see how much it would fold on the river Ooh, if let's, talk, let's, let's let's talk offline about something but yeah okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm interested in whatever yeah <laughs> sort of crazy ai yeah. you're doing um but with pio at least you can't do that but i i think i assume it's around i usually say high 40s yeah so your intuition i think i i have i have it on good authority your intuition is very good it's very close okay. to what he has. <laughs> yeah because basically the way i'm doing that is just and this is getting sort of technical but yeah if you think about mandatory defense frequency versus two-thirds river bet yeah you want to be folding is it 40 percent of the time versus two -third, two -thirds uh, versus two-thirds versus two-thirds it would be well, let's see, pot would be 50%. You would need to fold around 40%. Yeah, I think it'd, yeah. I think it'd be 37%. I think it's exactly what it would be. Like you'd have to call. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Anyway, it's around it's around 40. Yeah. And then Pio in most lines folds like 4 or 5% more than that versus a two-thirds bet. 
and mm. some lines it pulls a lot more mm. so i'm imagining just like because two-thirds is the most common bet size it's like the average bet size you face sure. on the river so yeah. basically 40 and then add five to ten percent probably for the yeah. the pio overfold um but yeah so i mean even if you're over defending how much are you can over defend by like you're gonna fold 40 um yeah i've seen like the the most insanely aggressive players i've seen i think get to the into the 30s like maybe it's it's like possible to get into the high 20s if you're just calling like every bluff catching spot yeah but you know a certain like percentage of the time you're just not even going to have a bluff catcher when you face a bet mm, that's a good that's a good point so, yeah so like that's got to be like that's got to be fairly often right that's okay you have like a, just a dead hand that like yeah if 20 percent of the time you just don't have anything you know so like you just don't have the option to call <laughs> or something like that like yeah so but anyway most players tend to overfold they're in like the 50s um or even i mean like versus like, river triple barrel i've seen pools that are like the fold frequency is like 60 percent, for example you know it's just like ab absurdly high at mid mid stakes i've seen you know to facing like a third c bet in like a single race pot spot i've seen stats are like 60 so yeah exceptionally high yeah so this is like this is actually changing i, I think like every year or two people get a bit better populations get a little bit better at defending rivers as people get better at playing poker and people mm -hmm. become I, I think we generally are on, on a track to people playing more aggressively as yeah. they get better because the solvent plays very aggressively and people are studying more with solvers um but generally on like on average regulars do overfold the river and then fish also overfold the river too and that's that's what people uh struggle to believe more mm. because what happens with fish is they play a very random preflop range mm -hmm. and like they'll literally open eight three offsuit from the button and then the next orbit they'll fold queen nine offsuit sometimes mm. they'll do random shit like that like a recreational player you shouldn't apply like the logic of a linear range to any sort of action that a recreational is doing mm. you should always account for some randomness and so what happens with recreationals is if you're if you think about just like what happens when a player is playing sort of randomly against you and not starting like calling their strongest hands and then starting to fold more as they get down to their weakest hands in a linear way what happens is when you do get bluff caught by a recreational player they will sometimes show up with something absurd, like they'll call <laughs> you down with fifth pair, but you're not yes. seeing the like other situations where they fold top pair just because they had a feeling. Mm. Um, yeah. And so recreationals, like they'll defend a little bit better on average than yeah. drags. And it's kind of funny, like post flop recreationals frequencies. Yeah. They're more aggressive. So there's a lot of situations where they're closer to a solver yeah. than the average recreational player right than the average regular player the recreationalists do a lot of things right actually post flop yeah. yeah but um even recreational is still overfold and yeah. that's where like so, sort of like uh, maybe you shouldn't get too deep into this but there's like a lot of randomness in it there's some lines where they will over defend slightly there's like some random lines where they're overfold like crazy mm. and yeah that's just more like random whereas so once you start giving people like all, all of this data to be able to like make decisions with do you, or even you personally, one side effect I've seen of even just like all the fact that like people are using data to make decisions is now when I coach people and they don't have that data, they feel handcuffed to exploit without that data, right? They're like, I can't make any sort of exploitative adjustment in my mind without data do you think this is a reasonable sentiment or do you or do you yourself find yourself having a higher bar of what it takes for you to take an exploitative line or do you feel the opposite has happened that you feel more willing so like in a spot where you haven't looked at the data or you're not you don't remember the data but you just assess this is likely a spot that's going to be overfolded to like go for it or are you really waiting for the 
data to take a line that might be non-standard? No, because you can almost always extrapolate. Um, so even if you don't like have data, which is helping you make a decision in a specific situation, you can try to think of other similar situations that you might have studied right? and what people generally do. Yeah. But I, I think would, yeah. it's also just kind of the way you look at it. If you feel like you are totally reliant on this data and you can't think for yourself, yeah, then you will sort of manifest that right. reality. But the way I've always looked at it is the exploits reinforce the theory and the theory reinforces the exploits. Right. That's why my current company is called Mobius Poker because a Mobius strip is like a continuum. Mm. And that's why I named it after that because I've always felt like theory and exploits were two sides of, of the same coin. And if you're getting better at one, you're getting better at the, the other. other. Yeah, definitely. So what what do you think like... What, would, what do you think is the generally good advice for someone who has no access to all the data then though? Like surely, how would you frame like exploitative adjustments with like SANS data? Like how, how would you think about it? Let's assume like you don't have all the data you have. Uh, well, there's no reason to not do some database analysis because like everybody has data. You, you just have your own hands that you've played. Yeah. If you played even 50,000 hands, that's enough to start doing some work in hand to note. Right. And looking at what your population is doing. Yeah. So I would encourage people to like just open their mind a little bit and use all of the tools available and not just assume they can't. Um, if you don't, I mean, there's, you can also just go like lean really hard into the theory right. side. And if your approach is to do that, you just, I think, need to be careful about following theory as if it's like a manual that you, yeah. like a Bible for what you have to do. That's not really what we, like what you should be doing. You should be studying theory and just thinking about like the frequencies and the outputs of the solver and thinking critically about it. And when you see a spot that's like, oh, this spot's really hard to defend. Yeah, that's should right like set off an alarm in your head like, oh, this would be a good spot to over bluff if people aren't going to be defending these combos here right. naturally. Yeah. So you can approach it from any way you want, I think. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Because I think I had, you know, I did a talk with Kevin Rabichow and he and I are good friends. And we talk about this kind of a lot about how like trying to get people to start thinking basically just in that way of like how how natural is the defense in this spot that you're in and because i think i think what has happened with the advent of like like the knowledge of things like poker detox is that a lot of people feel like that is the bar for exploitative adjustments like you have this like kind of combination of like people thinking like you said solvers are bibles and then you have like okay and then if there's obviously good reasons to adjust but like you need this much information like which is what like you know, people at like poker detox and stuff have been establishing. And yeah, I think it's, it's good to just sh like, I, I think it's hard sometimes to get people to realize like you can just, I don't know how you think about this though. Cause for me, I think you can use human intuition somewhat reasonably and in understanding what will be overfolded just by thinking about what's psychologically easy for a human being to call with when dealing specifically with uh, regs, regulars. Like I think, but I don't know if you would agree with that because I don't know if your data has shown that it's not, there's no correlation between regs having hold weak holdings and them like, like spots where they're capped and like where they're overfolding or if that, if that doesn't correlate or, you know, um, I would say that if you've done population research, what happens is you're, so some people have better intuitions than others. Yeah, And if you're like a very winning player, let's assume that your intuition is probably pretty good about where people fold more and where people fold less if you're yeah. crushing online. Right. I can make that leap and assume that that's probably correct. But I think where people get messed up is that if they don't have any sort of, they've never looked into data at all, their calibration might be off. So you might be right that someone's folding 5% more here and 5% less there 
but that doesn't really matter if they're overfolding by 10% on average on both spots. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's where you can get lost, I think. And mm. you, you kind of get lost in the, the variations when really like the, the threshold is down here and you're just looking mm. at these meaningless. And so you're taking, you're taking the spots where people like really overfolding as opposed to like the spots where people are overfolding by 2%, which is just as profitable a spot to be going, going ham in a spot. Like if someone's yeah, overfolding so by any amount, you know? So if you're like in a really passive environment, for example, and you just do a little bit of research into how your the regs in your pool are playing and you see like, oh, the regs in my pool are just like massively overfolding rivers. You can kind of turn your brain off to all of that and just like blast Fire all rivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I kind of want to pivot if that's all right with you, because this has been interesting, but you, we, there's been a lot of, of Twitter drama going on lately. And I've wanted to, ha to have a conversation with somebody about this. And you posted on Twitter, uh, talking about like YouTube and Twitter, and I'm not going to read the post again, but, um, actually I'll just ask you, like, do you want to like rehash your views on this kind of like what kind of what that post was about and like what you were putting forward on, um, Yeah. I just, I started a YouTube channel recently. You can search Mobius Poker on YouTube if you want to look it up. And I was kind of amazed by how positive the response was. Mm. Uh, I already have a couple thousand subs on there, which is quite a lot considering I have like 6,000 Twitter followers. Mm, yeah. And I started this channel not even two months ago. So like I... Pretty much if I just keep uploading like once a week, I'm probably on track to having more yeah. followers on YouTube than my Twitter account that I've been building for two years by like end of the summer, maybe. So YouTube is a much bigger platform, first of all. Yeah. Which is great. Twitter's like pretty small. It's kind of a bubble. Yeah. Um, But my post was kind of about how I noticed like also YouTube is not just bigger, it's more positive. Yeah, than Twitter because I've been making these videos and a lot of people will just comment like great video or just yeah. I love this video this was great thank you for sharing this and yeah. you, like you never really get that on Twitter <laughs> great for post. various reasons yeah um and there are a few trolls on YouTube but there's not that many like they're yeah. vastly outnumbered by the positive comments and my stuff on YouTube gets way more likes too yeah like. I think, you know, this is a weird thing about Twitter. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but I don't think I've ever seen a poker account have a viral tweet. Mm -hmm. And not even close to viral, but like, I think the most likes I've ever seen a poker tweet or even a poker account tweeting anything is like 3,000, maybe mm -hmm. four or 5,000. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be like this ceiling that we can't break through like there's just tweets in poker twitter just like die in poker <laughs> and then they, they never escape poker twitter yeah um, which is weird but youtube videos seem to get a lot more likes a lot more positive comments and i just after you know going through twitter and building a following there i was like wow this is just so much more rewarding yeah um and i started to think about why is twitter so negative and toxic and one of the things that i realized was that the user interface plays into that a lot mm. the the design of twitter almost to me looks like a scoreboard so you have the tweet mm. and then you have right under the tweet you've got the number of likes number of retweets and a number of comments yeah and you can see that very clearly and then you can open up the tweet and you can see all of the comments and the same stats for each comment. It's very easy to see mm. which comment has the most likes. Mm. And it's very easy, obviously, to see if a comment ratios <laughs> the original tweet yeah. or if someone gets more comments than likes on their original tweet. And it creates sort of this like sport, I think, of dunking on people mm. because like if you ratio somebody, yeah. You tons of likes and you get people following you for that so you don't really need to have an original idea you can just dunk on other people's ideas and you can gain a following that way yeah so i, I think that's just sort of a fatal 
flaw of Twitter. And then there's other things too that I don't really like about Twitter. Like you can see anyone's likes. You can just yeah. click on their likes and see what they're liking, which I I do enjoy that sometimes because I like to see what other people are liking, especially if I find someone who I think has good taste and is yeah. looking at things. But I think that makes people a little bit stingier with liking content. Yeah. Potentially. Um, I didn't know that. And now I'm going to be stingier with liking content. <laughs> you didn't know that you can just see your likes. I'm like a million years old, man. I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> I'm so bad with social media. I, I, I mean, that's interesting. I wonder how many people don't know that. But if you just go to any profile, you can see. Yeah, it's a, it's, I actually think of it now. I can, yeah. I can. Yeah, it's like a panel, right? You like go over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's that too. I think that makes positive feedback a little bit less. Yeah. And then there's the character limit also, which yeah. obviously is a whole other issue. Because yeah, you it's, can. It's way easier to nitpick somebody else's argument it's like the perfect setup for just pedantic weirdos that want to nitpick like a concise argument there's i think there are it seems like there's people who just only do this on twitter like they just sit back and they just find something wrong with ah oh, dude it's 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 so depressing because like i it's really sad to see what's happened to some people on twitter that's kind of what i wanted to talk about is because like I'm watching some people just like just spend so much time on Twitter and you're really it really does not condition the best version of anybody. Right. Like everyone's kind of, like so many people are just putting their worst foot forward and then responding to the worst foot forward of somebody else. And then like they're just going back and forth like this and they're there and it's been really sad to watch this happen just to honestly, from my view, watch this like escalate in the poker community over the last 18 yeah. months or so. Like it's just gotten out of control. And there was, um, there's a quote, um, by, I think her name is Marilyn Robinson, who that says like the, the language of public life has lost the, the character of generosity. And that is like, to me, the perfect quote for like just what I see on Twitter. It's just like people constantly assuming the worst, the worst possible intention of the other person. Cause it's like what you said, it's the easiest way to like dunk on somebody and just yeah. be like, if I just assume the worst intention from you, I can, that's the, that's the easiest thing to export. Like to, to frame an argument is difficult and to assume someone's going to understand my argument is difficult, but I can just like, I can just dunk on you, assume that you're a terrible person and just like send that off into the Twitter verse. And it's interesting you mention how we poker seems to be trapped, like poker Twitter seems to be trapped within poker Twitter, like we can't escape it because that itself seems to set up the incentives to try to escape it, right? To like try to raise the stakes of drama and raise the stakes of things so that like if there's like a like a incentives on like audience capture, all these people who are trying to like grow their audiences and especially to get to like more and more recreational and like to get out of poker. Yeah, yeah, it sets up a really sick incentive to just like, because like the drama has gotten out of control lately. I don't know if you feel similarly. Yeah, and that actually makes me think the one thing in recent memory that really did escape poker Twitter was the right. Robbie scandal. Yeah. So that, I, I think that was actually a counterpoint to what I said earlier. Yeah. Some things actually can escape. But that poker. was, I mean, if that's what it takes though, like that was <laughs> such a, that was such a big deal too, but like there were just like there were there are raw facts about this that made it, you know, prone to export. Like we'll probably never see something like that again in poker. Yeah, that was a perfect storm for sure. Yeah, it was just like a perfect <laughs> storm. Like the fact that she gave the money back, the fact that it was like there's just raw facts. Like I said, like the fact that it was like a man who did this to a woman. The fact that like there's just there's so many things that like allowed it to just be framed as this really big story that like got out. You know, or and, how about just like the fact that it ran out. And Garrett missed both runouts. <laughs> yeah, like that. That's yeah, like <laughs> oh, man. Like even if he just wins one of those, it's probably not nearly as big of a story. Yeah. And if he if he wins both, maybe people don't even notice. Oh yeah, like, he wins just like a stupid recreational player. He was like thirty percent, right? Like he was he was extremely live. Like, I think it was a flip. Yeah. Was it a flip? Because it wasn't on the turn. It had to be pretty. I mean, he had a. Flop. He had draw 
he had six pair outs, a flush draw, and an open ended straight draw, I believe. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, if it was so that it was bad. like pretty unlikely that it would that yeah. he would lose both when they ran it twice. <laughs> oh my god, it's just so crazy. That hand was just so wild. But yeah, I mean. But then I think it's, that almost gave people like a drug, right? Like now it's like, this is what we're trying to get back to. Like, especially with the whole like Berkey and airball thing right now, like so much of this feels so forced, but like, I don't want to get into too many particulars, but too many particular examples. Generally, it's just been very sad to be on the sidelines watching poker Twitter feel like it's just like devolving and devolving more and more by like the main speakers yeah. in the space. Yeah, it, it is. For me, it's sad. I, I mean, obviously, people can use these platforms however they want. Yeah. And especially like if you're just someone who's kind of watching from the sidelines and you're not hurting anybody, really, you're just like showing up for entertainment as if it's kind of like a reality TV show or something yeah. similar to that. I mean, people can do whatever they want, but it's sad for me. And, and I'm assuming this probably plays into why it's sad for you, because I try to like approach poker very professionally yeah and i would like it to be taken seriously and it, i feel like it just reflects poorly on the whole industry yeah when people are just like just name calling <laughs> yeah every day on all day on twitter yeah and and it yeah i agreed no i mean like i really would like to be i like at this point in my life like I'm only going to get more ingrained in poker likely as like my life continues, right? Like it's going to be more and more staple of probably who I am. And I would really like there to be a, a good association with what it's like to be in poker. And it's been, yeah. I mean, fortunately, like you said, Twitter is small. So that is, that is the only upside, like in the realm of social media and things like Twitter is fairly small, but it's just, yeah. I'm just wondering if there's, do you do you view any way out of this for the people on Twitter or like no <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, well that was sort of the point of my yeah tweet that I wrote about this was that if you are a coach and you want to like grow your brand and you don't want to just be screaming at people all day every day for engagement then you might want to consider other platforms like YouTube or if you don't yeah. want to do YouTube you can do podcast blog even yeah and like pretty much anything is better than twitter or a lot of people are doing discord groups now i think you have one right yep yep yeah so i mean consider that because they're more positive and they're also bigger yeah so it's like why are we really i mean i i do there's a lot of things i like about twitter but at this point it's like why are we really on here <laughs> yeah it's crazy i i um i have noticed what's funny is like multiple people who because I'm you know I try to post content on Twitter I'm terrible at posting at, at crafting tweets um I because I have a I have a stigma against like framing engineering things too much you know what I mean like I I, I want it to feel very authentic and that approach has actually worked well for me on YouTube and Instagram like you're saying like when I post something that just feels very authentic I just make a video talking to the camera or like putting something out it does fairly well like I get good engagement and this approach has fallen completely flat on Twitter. <laughs> if I, you know, like I'm just getting nothing and it's because, yeah, you're in this ecosystem, like what you're competing for is, or against what you're competing against is like, yeah, all these people screaming at each other. And like, there's just, or there are, I mean, there are not, I mean, I don't want to berate everybody. Like Jason Sue has amazing content on, on Twitter and he just puts out good things. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, I agree. I generally agree with you that I think the move is just, yeah migrate and uh but i also just feel sad for the i actually view a lot of these people who are wrapped up in this i don't take any sides like i think everybody who's yelling at each other i think in their private lives i'm sure are reasonable good people like you know like i think it must be the case that like everyone we're seeing attack each other and twitter is just bringing out the worst in them and it it's honestly sad to me because like there's people who i've respected as people and poker players for so long and it's like, why are you behaving this way? Like, why, you know, like yeah. I'm, it's just, why are you doing this? Like, this is not worth your time. This is not worth, this doesn't reflect well on you. Like, and I'm, again, I feel so confident that none of these people are like bad people are like, are, I don't think anyone who's like caught up trying to defame somebody else is actually that way. 
to anyone that they see, you know, to like anyone that they run into and that, that they talk to and the way they interact with them. And so mm. it's not even just poker as a whole. It's just like it's kind of tragic to watch people who I've respected for so long just get caught into these things and just like even erode. It's selfish, but like erode what I thought this person it doesn't even really erode that. It's just it's all just a sim simple symptom of Twitter. I think like we're all victims of Twitter at this point. <laughs> like, yeah, but I think and then people will probably some people will laugh really hard at me even saying this, but I always say you should try to treat people on the Internet the same way that you would treat them if you were talking face to face with them. Of course, in but there's obviously just that that doesn't work for it's like very counterintuitive for most people they just forget that and to be fair it's really difficult to do that though like i've had in interactions with people that i've i i agree 100 percent, and i've had interactions with people over twitter that i it's only in retrospect i look and see like i never would have like the way that i said this i never would have said this to this person yeah person. i've had situations like that too right like and so it's even and that speaks to like the corrosive effect of this media, this like outlet, I think it's just like even people who are trying really hard, like I would say I try really hard to do that. It's it's just easy to like you don't have all the feedback that you would of a person to person interaction. You know what I mean? Like you don't have looking at looking at somebody and and it's even worse than that. You have the opposite oftentimes like that's that's the thing that I think a lot of people miss is like. People are like, why can't I act this way? Look at the way these other people are acting. But it's like, no, but they also wouldn't be acting that way. You know, that's like, that's the thing I think a lot of people miss is that you're reacting to false versions of people as well. Like this isn't, it's not like you're getting, again, people's best foot forward on Twitter. Like, it's not like that's not what's happening. You're, it's the analogy I've heard, which I really agree with. It's just a funhouse mirror. Like, you, you walk into, you know, you get into Twitter and it's just a funhouse mirror. Nothing is as it seems like, and, but it's, your brain is such a good storytelling mechanism. The more time you spend on Twitter, the more that just seems the way people are, the way the world is. And yeah. so I think sometimes when that, when people laugh at the, you know, recommendation, you should treat people the same. It's because they're like, they're so inundated in this virtual world. They're like, no, this, these are the social norms. Like these are how we interact in this space, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's really sad. Um, this is this is just me venting. That's what this conversation has become. But <laughs> yeah, I, I think like a good counterpoint to what I said is that sometimes the internet is like a really great place to make fun of other people and just like laugh. <laughs> <at shit. laughs> of course, yeah. But like I do worry because you can you can do things as an individual. There's nothing ethically wrong with it. Like liking a funny video of somebody embarrassing themselves in some way or yeah. just like you know just liking a video that is negative towards a person because it's funny or whatever but then like if a million people do the same thing that you're doing yeah now that person's life is it's ruined, like ruined. <laughs> like, like for at least for those moments like so it's just scary how like and, and i've been on the other side of this in the past so i know what it feels like to get just dragged through poker twitter to be the mm. star of poker twitter for a day um and it's brutal especially when you've got people with much bigger followings who are trashing you yeah what happened uh, to you i don't i must have missed this um i don't know if you want to read so it. <laughs> i i coach a group of brazilian mtt players and uh this was i think it was it was actually Christmas Day of 2021. Fedor Holtz posted a tweet between he he posted a hand between two of those guys online mm. where one of the guys made a very tight but correct fold preflop um against the other guy's three bet at a final table. And Fedor just like really just with only one hand just said, This is collusion. These guys are cheating. Mm. Um and and kind of painted the entire group of players as cheaters and i was coaching them i still am coaching them and uh like i had a a coaching for profits agreement with them too so it was sort of like fedor was coming yeah. after my business by doing this 
and I, I wrote a thread in response and there's definitely things that I would have wrote differently if I wrote it today. I think it came right. across a little bit too strong, but um, basically I just said that I, I think these guys are honest and legitimate and like you can't just take one hand history. Right. Looks suspicious. Like if there's anything we've learned. It's a final table too. You can't just take one hand history. Yeah. Um, and make these huge accusations. Yeah. But the thing is, Fedor has 60 or 70,000 followers on Twitter. Yeah. And I had 2000 at the time. So I was like standing up against him and it just, I just got completely trashed. And it really, it, it ruined my Christmas. I remember yeah. it very well. Like yeah. it, it, just, it was brutal. Like people were telling me, <laughs> a couple of people responded that I should never have children <laughs> because <laughs> like, like really like vicious, <laughs> just fucked up trolling. Oh my God, man. Yeah. This is exactly what I mean though. When I say like, that's why I love this quote. I posted on Twitter around a lot of the Pope quote drama, but like naturally it's a quote. So it got no engagement, but it's, it's that as it really res rings true to me. It's like the language of public life has lost the character of generosity in the sense that we're not willing. It is now I get to accuse you of something and defend yourself, right? Like it's just, yeah. it's, it's just as long as there's smoke, there's fire until you can prove otherwise. And it's just so, that like that sounds terrible. Like I've been a m very minor subject of attention from Charlie Carroll and his following. And like just what it does psychologically to you to feel like there's like a mob coming after you. You know what I mean? Of of nameless, faceless people. I can't imagine that. That sounds like a lot more people and like really, really awful. But I just don't know. I would really love for people to start just extending. I don't know, just more just fewer assumptions of ill will towards everybody you know like there's just so many assumptions of like when i see something the the as long as as because it looks bad or even if it doesn't look bad i can assume ill will and you need to defend otherwise as a instead of like well, let's assume goodwill until we have evidence of ill of bad will you know like let's just let's just assume reasonable things are happening until there's good evidence to the contrary and yeah. Yeah, the Twitter that is like if I could like summarize what I think is wrong with engage with interaction on Twitter, it's that it's just like we're just everyone's so fast to assume the worst possible intention from somebody else instead of like I don't know if you remember uh, when someone posted that video of uh, Vogel saying jogging like jogging. Yeah. I can't remember who posted it, but I remember it got posted and then it was like a huge thing. And this is why Phil Galfond, though, is such like a good character in the yeah. poker community is because his response gave both people like the person who was saying you're 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 bullying this guy and the person who posted the original video phil galfon extended both of them the presumption of goodwill like the guy who was like you're bullying he didn't he didn't pick a side he was like look you're probably trying to look out for people bullying that makes sense this guy was probably just trying to make a joke you know and we just need so much more of that in Twitter of just like, look, the guy just thought it was funny because Vogel saying tanks forever. Like, that's it. Like, he just he's he tanks forever. This is not the time to, like, take up your mantle against, you know, like, it's just and maybe it maybe maybe it was in bad taste. Maybe you can say, like, hey, this was like not whatever. But like to presume like, no malice, this person is has hate in their hearts and we must respond, you know, like it's just uh yeah. yeah yeah it's it's a lost art for sure yeah and i feel like not to harp on this too much but i, I actually i think it's only going to get worse unfortunately yeah. and one of my biggest fears about ai actually yeah is that as more and more work is taken off of the average person's yeah plate and just automated with ai and like the more free time and leisure time that we have yeah. the more people are just going to uh, focus on like culture wars and celebrity drama and just like people just stuff. want to be entertained yeah just 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 to have something to do yeah i mean uh, I, we saw it in covid right like covid exploded with like yeah, all of this like exploded so much of this my yeah 
there's uh, there's so many people I know who just like came out of COVID like wrapped up in all sorts of like weird online ideas and like not just that but like feeling so passionately about things that they had no points of contact with you know like and it's it's like you're, all of a sudden you're like furious about something and I'm like what have you been spending your time doing um yeah anyway I think we've beat this to death so that's uh that's it but Honestly, I have nothing else to discuss unless there's something you want to talk about. But I think this has been a, this is, I think we did it. This is a good amount of time. <laughs> nice. Yeah. How long have we been going for? I didn't even. An hour. Wow. Well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I could just, I could probably talk about it forever. I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I just think to summarize or, or I don't know, yeah. to, to offer something, I would just say, personally, if I didn't, run my business on social media i would probably be off of it at this point mm -hmm. uh or at least off of twitter because i think twitter is the most yeah sick. and and just like if you don't have a business if you don't rely on it just like take a step back and maybe take a few weeks off every once in a while and just try to figure out if this is making your life better or if it's actually making it worse because <clears throat> i don't think people realize like how much work and like how many literal geniuses are behind the scenes yeah. working on these products these social media platforms to get you coming back to them yeah like in the same way that a recreational poker player sits down at an online poker table with yeah. five regulars and just has no idea like the level of technology that these guys are studying with yeah. um and that they're just completely dead in the water. They're just outgunned. Yeah. It's the same way for social media. Like some of the brightest minds of our yeah. generation are working for Facebook or working for. Yeah. And that way you also have like, you have AI assisted, assisting all of this, right? Like, yeah. so it's just, yeah, you, we are, we are all outgunned in terms of maneuvering social media in a way that delivers any of us, any real agency, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. So I guess consider quitting or taking time off or if not just try to be nicer to people that's yeah. all i would say i hope i hope us in poker can find a way just to do the last let's just try to be nicer to people but i, I agree with you that i'm not extremely hopeful but also um, follow me on twitter and but also yeah and also yeah follow me. i was gonna say you know it's funny that what was coming up was well do you want to tell people where to find you though that's, yeah let me just yeah. plug my stuff really quick no yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no really I'm though at, plug your stuff <laughs> i'm at moby's poker on pretty much everything um, okay. You, YouTube. YouTube. Are you, are you on Instagram? I have an Instagram. I don't really post very much poker stuff. I don't know what to post on Instagram, but maybe I'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. Cool, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you doing this. And I appreciate the conversation and until next time. Yeah, it was fun. Right. Thank you. Yep.